Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming out today to uh, the next day, the current day of Apollo Palooza. Um, we have an incredible panel here today. Uh, my name is John Wenzel. I'm a reporter for the Denver Post. Um, I typically write about features, arts and entertainment, and I've done some freelancing for national magazines, but uh, in the run-up to Apollo 50, um, I was lucky enough to write about uh, this panel, about Apollo Palooza, and so many of the incredible things going on here um, in Colorado and at Wings in particular. Um, but let's, let's get to our esteemed panel. Um, to my left here, we have uh, Coy Jones, and, and these guys are all going to talk a little bit more about themselves after we get started, so I won't go into too much detail, um, but I will say just real quickly, um, he, was at, he started at Johnson in 64. He was, uh, worked on Apollo, Gemini, spacecraft uh, recovery. Um, to his left, we have uh, Wayne Ottinger. Uh, Ottinger, I'm sorry. Wayne Ottinger. Um, he worked on uh, lunar landing vehicles um, throughout his career and founded um, his own aerospace company a little over a decade ago. Um, and then finally, to his left, we have Tom Thayer. Um, he has worked with uh, Douglas Aircraft, Lockheed, including at the Waterton Canyon facility, um, helped calculate moon trajectories, re-entry. Uh, all of these guys are living legends. Please help me in uh, giving them a warm welcome today. And then, like I said, we're going to start with them uh, talking a little bit about themselves uh, and their career, and then we'll probably do some questions. <clears throat> oh, the clicker? <laughs> There we go. There we go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? This uh, first picture is uh, one that I use on my uh, computer for my background. It was a picture published in Life magazine. Uh, in late summer of 1964, a few months before we made our first flight. And it was made with Neil Armstrong in the cockpit. The live photographer had us drag it out into the lake bed at Edwards. And my crew chief had to take a broom and broom off the tire tracks. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he had strobe lights set around that. And this is a picture that I've always cherished because it was such a well, uh, photography piece with the uh, sun in the mid-afternoon and the strobe-like effects and so forth. This is uh, a quick summary of my 30 years of aerospace experience. And uh, I did five years of jet engine flight testing, uh, and then uh, uh, rockets for about three years on the X-15, and then I went into the Apollo program with my lunar landing research and training vehicles. This is uh, another 30 years of experience in high-tech fields that were stemmed off in some cases from the aerospace industry. And uh, this is like 70 years ago when I was 16 years old uh, flying an airplane just like this in our high school flying club. This is a picture that 
I had taken when I was 30 years old at the rollout of my lunar landing research vehicle. I was a NASA project engineer and the uh, plant representative helping Bell to design the Bell Aero Systems in Niagara Falls, New York, and we were designing the uh, and developing the lunar landing research vehicle. And uh, I'm 30 years old at the rollout in, at Bell Air. Uh, uh, General Walter Dornberger, who was von Braun's boss in Germany at the Pinilumi uh, missile uh, facility in Germany, uh, he was vice president working half time at the time, getting ready to retire at Bell. And uh, this is a quick overview of starting with the first flight in 1903 of the Wright brothers going out to the Apollo lunar landing and uh, a lot of milestones along the way that give you an idea of, and uh, the originator of this slide was my friend Paul Jurdy who's sitting out in the audience today. This uh, is a picture of the illustrating the helicopter in the upper left. Uh, and that would be the up, upper, yeah, upper left on your side. I'm looking at the monitor down here, having to get my orientation. But it shows the uh, attitude of a helicopter uh, flying here on the Earth in order to translate horizontally. And what we had to do with the lunar lander uh, was to uh, simulate here on the Earth the, uh, and take the pitch attitudes to account for the 1.6 G thrust. And then the limb attitude shown uh, how the how it compares to the uh, earthbound simulation of what it would be like to land on the moon. This graph is an actual record of the pitch attitudes that Neil made uh, in his actual landing when he had to take over manually to avoid the boulders and, bold, uh, boulders and, and craters as he was coming in, where it took him into that, he called it a stadium-sized crater. And he had about 23 seconds of, of fuel left. And he felt very comfortable because he said it was just like flying the LLTV here on the Earth. <laughs> because that's about how much fuel they had left when they were practicing. Now this is a... Uh, I think this is a movie. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is over of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space. Soon after President Kennedy's call to go to the moon in 1961, a number of researchers began to think about the various aspects of a lunar flight. NASA's Flight Research Center at Edwards proposed a free flight lunar landing simulator program. The research test vehicle was intended to investigate the inherent problems of lunar descents where there is no drag and weight is only one sixth of Earth. The proposed technique for simulating the lunar gravity install a jet engine underneath or within the machine on gimbals, so the thrust was always vertically upward. The engine thrust would then be adjusted so that the craft's net weight, that is its gross weight minus the engine thrust, would equal its lunar equivalent. The force required to lift the net weight would be provided by throttleable rockets. The first flight of the LLRV in October of 64 was flown by Joe Walker. First liftoff, was what you might call tentative. The second was considerably smoother 
during the following year, Phil Walker and Don Malik flew about 150 development flights, expanding the flight envelope and investigating the adequacy of the design and the systems. An advanced version of the LLRV, the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle, or LLTV, proved to be an excellent simulator and was highly regarded by the Apollo Lunar Module crews as necessary for lunar landing preparation. Typically, the pilot took off with the gimbals locked, flew out to the inner marker, which in this case was about four to 500 feet altitude, about a quarter of a mile from the intended touchdown spot. Arriving at the IP, he began a descent toward the target, switched into the lunar simulation mode, energized the lift rockets, and practiced the lunar landing. I was most fortunate to be involved throughout the entire lunar flying development. I had the pleasure of flying every one of the machines, the LLRF, the ground-based simulators, the LLRV, the LLTV, the lunar module, and even the Weber ejection seat, the last not by choice. NASA management was forever worried about the reliability and safety of these machines and continually wanted to shut them down but the pilots insisted they were vital to lunar landing preparation, and they prevailed. Buzz and Mike. We're standing on your shoulders, building on your historic achievements. That drive to reach higher is alive and well in today's astronauts, who will travel aboard Orion on our very challenging path to Mars. This is, uh, I think, the last slide in my pitch here, and it's uh, one of my favorites because back in December of 2008, I was working as a uh, senior advisor on the uh, Constellation Altair program, and we had this meeting all day in Houston uh, with four moonwalkers uh, advising what I call the youngins how we did the training in the 1960s. And um, you can see Jack Schmidt, Harrison Jack Schmidt in the background behind me, and uh, Neil on my right, and Gene Cernan, the last man on the moon on, the, on my left. That's it. I'm going to uh, do this standing up. Um, this is a, uh, I've gone back in time. Uh, I hear that laser printer or laser pointers don't work very well with these L L LCD screens. So I'm going to use one of these. <laughs> it's, it's a uh, mop handle from the, the janitorial. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a, uh, it's a uh, mop handle from our janitorial staff. I want to give them credit. <laughs> okay. um, I thought I'd just go right to a subject that is uniquely uh, Apollo, and that's re-entry. It wasn't always called re-entry. Uh, NASA preferred entry, but it's so ingrained in our, our lives now that I'm going to use re-entry. I, I started back in 1966. I was hired by this gentleman named Bob Manders. He was my boss and uh, remains a good friend, and I've enlisted his help in this, partially because he was one of the original authors of the re-entry corridor, but also he, he had a... Uh, a lifelong kind of experience with Apollo. He was on all of the missions, including Apollo 13, 
And he was on the white team of Gene Kranz's mission director uh, work. Okay. This is going to be quick. <laughs> uh, 15 minutes is hardly enough for, for this subject. So uh, I'm going to talk about how we did it, uh, how we planned it, and then how we executed it on Apollo 11. The official uh, task description is up there for you to read, but fundamentally it was to design a, a safe corridor for returning from uh, orbit. And um, let's go to the next one. Okay, this, this is the whole thing on one chart. Don't try to read it. <laughs> you can't do that. But there are two orbits here of interest. This one is called the translunar orbit. It establishes a, a circular orbit around the moon. This one, this is, this is the one we're going to be talking about. It starts here, ends over at the Earth, and it is called the trans-Earth orbit. They fire the rocket to return way back here on the backside of the, the moon. It's like shooting ducks. The Earth is going to be over here by the time they get there, three days later. On this part of the orbit, they do three orbit adjusts, and then at, at this point right here, it's called the entry interface. And that's where my story really starts. Okay. The command module is confronted with two essential forces. One of them is gravity. You're familiar with that. The other is a centrifugal force. One wants to pull the command module into the Earth's atmosphere. The other one, the centrifugal force of the orbit, wants to put it in, keep it in orbit. The perigee is at 400,000 feet above the Earth, and at that point, the uh, uh, at, at perigee, 400,000 feet and 36,000 feet per second. Now that's going a little less than seven miles a second, and they planned all of this way back behind the moon. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Go back? Yep. Okay, so there, this is a, a, a game of boundaries. And Tom, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but don't be afraid to hold the mic. Right up right there? Up. Yeah, okay. just because it's, there's a little bit of ambient okay, noise. Okay, how's that? There. Yeah, okay, sorry to interrupt. Um, <clears throat> the, the overshoot boundary is the minimum angle that they can make with the Earth's atmosphere to, to go out of orbit. That's essential. They don't want to go, they don't want to stay in orbit because they can't, they don't have enough supplies like oxygen and they can't hit the, the landing point if they stay in orbit. So from the moon to landing is one big shot. Kind of risky actually. The other, the undershoot that's a boundary that is defined by how many G's the pilot and the, the spacecraft can take. There are operational boundaries. There, I won't talk about those very much, but those are the ones that determine whether they have enough energy to make it to the landing ship or the, the recovery ship. Finally, the thermal boundaries, that's the, the heating boundary. Uh, it turned out that the Apollo uh, heating shield, the heat shield, was really up to the task, and that was not even a close thing. Okay. 
The command module has a secret. You can steer it. I don't know if anybody knew that, but it's possible by moving the center of gravity off center from the symmetrical part of the spacecraft. That creates a drag vector in the, a little bit of lift, and they use that to great effect. If you look at the bottom of, well, first of all, that's it right there. If you look at the bottom of the spacecraft, you can see that the lift vector can be steered right and left by rolling the spacecraft. And that's what they did. If they wanted to go long to a, a, a landing point, they kept the lift vector up. If they wanted to go short, they rolled it down. If they were right or left, they could go like this. When they got a zero lift solution from the computer, they just rolled the vehicle. The ups and the downs canceled out. The rights and the lefts canceled out. And they went in like a stone. <laughs> That's called a ballistic reentry. OK. Now, this is the real first, um, this is the first uh, uh, entry corridor graph. These are the entry angles, all of them negative, 0 through minus 11. These are the speeds in 1,000 feet per second. 36,000 feet per second right here is their entry speed. If they come in between here and here, they'll be captured and this chart shows you what they'll experience in terms of gravity loads and skip distance. If they come in up in here someplace, they're too shallow and they'll go into orbit. These are the overshoot bounds. These are the undershoot bounds. And notice that the, the G levels go from 6 to 20. I think at 20, we lost the spacecraft. But it turns out that the astronauts are able to take 15 Gs very briefly, <laughs> very briefly. They planned, more likely, to go in the 6G region. So right in here is the sweet spot. OK. Now, this is a profile of what it looks like when they come in from, from 400,000 feet. This is altitude, and this is downrange. They do a, an initial heavy-duty dive into the atmosphere until the guidance computer sees a 1.4 G level. They do a pullout with the lift vector and do a skip. Now, this skip is not to soften the loads at all. It's for ranging. It's, it's called a loft. It goes up and almost out of the atmosphere again, and then back in for a second entry. The high G points are here and here. And they're both over six Gs. OK? One more. This is, it's a small version, but it's the real Apollo 11 reentry corridor. Here are the overshoot bounds. They only have one undershoot bound. That's at 12 Gs. These these are the range lines that tell them that they're going to they're going to be able to do a skip. And these are the heating boundaries. The little dashed lines. We we never came close to any problem there. And this was the Apollo 11 target right there. 
right in the sweet spot. <laughs> and guess what? They only missed the landing point by 1.8 miles. And that's it. Whenever you're ready. Hey, I'm Corey Jones, and uh, I was uh, with NASA for, for t 38 years at Houston. And my background is I have a BS in uh, aerospace engineering from the University of Texas, and I graduated in 1964. And I uh, started right away at, at NASA and in the landing and recovery division and of uh, flight operations. And the landing and recovery division was responsible for the mission as soon as the, the spacecraft hit the water. And so in the landing and recovery division, I uh, had a, a Apollo recovery task for the seven years I was in that organization. And as a project engineer, uh, I was a project engineer on water test vehicles, and that included boilerplate 25, which is an older uh, boilerplate, and boilerplate 1101, 1101A, which you can see right over here on the floor, and then uh, command module, which is a production line spacecraft uh, that was designated for a ground test. And uh, all three of these are still around. Uh, boilerplate 25 is at the Pate uh, Museum of Transportation in Fort Worth, and of course 1101 is right over here, and uh, Command Module 7 is up at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And besides my uh, project engineering on the test vehicles, I was also uh, tapped as to, to d go to the development on emergency access for the command module at the launch site in the event of a uh, launch abort. And I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, also, in Landing Recovery Division, uh, we supported all the missions, and about half of us uh, were assigned to missions, and I was, I was on several. I was on the first unmanned recoverable uh, command module mission, that was AS-201, and then I was an emergency access engineer on uh, Apollo 7 through 14 down at KSC. And then after, uh, after the mission, in order, in order to get the command module ready for transportation, we have to go through a deactivation process, which involves cleaning the, the residual fuels out of the uh, propellant tanks, the RCS propellant tanks, and also safing the pyros. When I first uh, got to NASA, my first uh, project was to uh, work with the bar plate 25, and this is a, a water tank we had in, our, in the hangar there at Ellington Air Force Base, and we're doing the uh, static stability measurement. That's me on the right. I was 21 at the time, so, and that was also the skinny tie era. We wore a lot of skinny ties. <laughs> And then from there, we went to, I went to Boiler Plate 1101, and uh, this was delivered to us in uh, early 1965. And uh, the, it was built over at Kelly Air Force Base Air Material Command after being designed in-house by our design group. And here we're doing, this is right after we received it, we're doing the uh, initial weight and gravity uh, CG analysis on it to make sure we've got the got it within the bounds of, of what the command module will look like after it uh, splashed down. And from there, I went to command module seven, and and we did uh, both block one and block two uh, tests out in the Gulf. This is off Galveston, and. Uh, this was, this was our group after the block one test, and when I'm talking about block one test, the requirement was be able to have the command module sustain the crew for 48 hours, and so this is the after picture, and the guys don't look too bad. The guys in the orange suits were our test subjects, and I'm standing in the hatch there. 
And then uh, early 68, they determined that we needed a, a emergency access capability, uh, which we called, ended up calling the jammed hatch kit. And that was before Apollo 7. So in this particular picture, this was Apollo 13 in uh, April of 70. And I'm in my command or emergency access garb. And beside me to my right, uh, your left, is the jammed hatch kit and that included tools to be able to uh, access the command module if they had a hard landing on either in the surf or uh, beach or the swamp or land around the launch pad and this was after a launch abort and the other piece of equipment uh, is a, a portable ventilator that uh, in case the astronauts were inca incapacitated which we assumed they would be after a a bad landing like that. And uh, I was on station here at our staging area for uh, pickup by the helicopters if, if needed. And in the far background you can see the gantry and that's Apollo 13 on the pad and this is launch morning. And so I like to think about 50 years ago this morning, that's where I, where I was on Apollo 11. And this is my last day in 2003. This is an obligatory picture in front of the Saturn V at, uh, at Houston. And that's my last chart. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, well, as I, I think it's pretty clear to everybody who's here this is a massive, any space project is a massive, complicated thing with hundreds of, if not thousands of people, countless pieces, things like that. So I, I guess my first question for these guys, just real quick, is um, you know, how, do, how do you like to think about what you did as an ecosystem? Is, is there like a metaphor that, that makes sense? You know, everything has to go right when you're on the pad, when you're in the air, years of testing before that, what's, what's a good way of thinking about this complicated process of bringing all these elements together, math, science, engineering, physical testing? I knew it. Um, <clears throat> I, I likened it a little bit like eating an elephant. Um, like eating what? An elephant. An elephant? <laughs> yes. Is this working? Yeah, I guess it is. Uh, one bite at a time. That's how we did it. And uh, it was long, hard work. Uh, I don't really have a metaphor that is life-changing. It's just, um, well, I like to be busy. And aerospace has done that for me. That, that's, that's the draw for me. Well, and some of these these time frames you were given were, as, as we were saying before the panel, I mean, some people don't accomplish that much in their entire lifetimes, and you had to do some of these things in months or a year. Um, how did you how did you approach those tight turnarounds and deadlines? Uh, a lot of it was well, <laughs> I was single at the time, and that helped. Yeah. Uh, the more seriously, um, we, were, we were given the opportunity when we were hired to answer a question that turned out to be really important. And that was, if we give you a task and you decide you can't do it or you need help of any, don't, don't worry about that. We'll get you that help, but tell us because we don't have time to do this twice has to be right the first time. And that, that was great instruction. Um, I don't know if you guys felt that pressure, but we certainly did, probably. Talk about pressure. Uh, it seemed like we were always behind having to make up uh, what they would like to have had. The astronauts would have loved to have had enough training time 
for the landing here on the Earth in order to have both the command pilot and the lunar module pilot trained. Mm -hmm. Because of late starts on contracts being let, problems in the development cycle, accidents happening, some were fatal, as we know about the Apollo pad fire, and even lost several astronauts and other test pilots checking out aircraft before the astronauts would fly it, but they'd be killed in T-38 accidents or helicopter accidents. In my case, I wound up running a crew of about 120 engineers and technicians down at Houston in 1967, up into 1968, and we were on 12 hour, two 12 hour shifts, 24 hours a day coverage, seven days a week. And this went on for almost two years. And I'll tell you, it has its impact on family life, marriages, uh, all kinds of things, and even health. Yeah, that's quite a crunch. It is a crunch. Yeah. From my perspective, I'm done. from my perspective, uh, what you had in Houston was a bunch of gun ho twenty-year-olds like me, and uh, that's when uh, JSC or Manned Spacecraft Center opened. Uh, was in 1964. Had been under construction for about three years, and and uh, we moved into the offices. I think in June of '64. And the first Gemini launch uh, was later that year. It was an unmanned Gemini. And we ran through Gemini real fast. And then we were already working on the Apollo, like uh, the water tests we did with 1101 over here. And uh, in order to, we were given a schedule. In order to stay on schedule, overtime is not a problem. You just worked and worked and weekends, whatever it took to stay on schedule and, and uh, do your part. Yeah. Well, with the technology you were working with, and I mean the classical definition of the word technology, whatever you had to use, the, the tools to do your job, um, how much different would your job be today? What, what were you using then and what would you be using now? No computers in Mercury, a tiny little one in Gemini. Yeah. Everything's analog in these days. One of you said, I, I, I forget who it was, it might have been you or Tom, I would have killed for a plotter. Describe what a plotter is. <clears throat> yeah. That was me. Um, all of the, the, the graphs, that one I showed you, it, it was in all blue, uh, those are all hand drawn with French curves and drafting boards and midnight oil. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, and the computers we used, would each one of those charts would take maybe five computer runs where you submitted it at six o'clock as you went home, and the next morning you hoped that it would be done. That the computers were very slow. For me, uh, when I was doing my uh, boilerplate work, especially the boilerplate work, we were always, I was always worried about the, the weight and the center of gravity. And the center of gravity is, is measured and then calculated. And uh, it would have been great to have a handheld calculator then, but, and, which I didn't. So I'd run back to the office and run into the design section and use their hand, or their hand cranked uh, Frieden calculator to punch in the numbers and uh, come up with a weight and center gravity and then run back to the, to the uh, shop and uh, have the technicians you know, move this weight or move that weight to get the CG just right. Because the CG, on, uh, especially for us, was important uh, to simulate the, the water, the attitude in the water, because uh, we were doing uprighting tests, we were doing flotation collar installations. Of course, the CG was uh, important uh, for re-entry too, slightly. Mm -hmm. I'd like to throw in a quick description of center of gravity measurement and maintaining 
establishing a dry center of gravity, but then facing a problem of having during flight operations to make sure that it didn't move during flight more than a, a, a very tight tolerance. Mm -hmm. The reason was we had limited control authority in our reaction control system, and in one case, it caused the loss of a vehicle and an ejection, but safely, of the pilot. Uh, but we would have to measure it within a tenth of an inch dry, and then during flight, with all the rocket and jet fuel, make sure it didn't exceed a half inch movement. And those were always challenges. We even used uh, uh, little lead boxes on the legs at the landing gear to add shot in order to maintain the, the CG because we had different pilots and different seat cushions for the ejection system. That was all CG driven because every pilot and astronaut that ever flew it had to get every three months rotated in a fixture in Burbank, California, and we had adjust the seat cushion thickness so that the CG of the pilot and the seat were two and a half inches offset from the center line of the ejection rocket, and that allowed a 45 degree sweep of the rocket thrust during an ejection because that was the best statistical uh, success of getting an ejection bit because you never know what attitude it was coming out at in a VTOL. Well, it's, it's funny if you watch some of the documentaries that are airing right now about the 50th anniversary or um, read some of the books these guys have been interviewed for over the years, um, you see that there's more of a gray area than you might expect between hard science and, you know, contextual work, jury rigging things in the moment, doing whatever it takes to get it done, to make it work. Um, did you feel prepared for that when, when you entered your respective fields, seeing that there's, there's, a, there's a line at which things start to go into the unknown a little bit and you have to kind of take it as it comes? You got to always be open to learning mm -hmm. because you d cannot assume you know it all. Yeah. And that, d that even extends down to the inspectors, the mechanics, and the technicians working with you. And we all have the same goal make it safe. Yeah, I, I go with that. Yes. <laughs> you don't disagree. <laughs> Um, well, and another thing I, I was thinking about in the run up to this and just for the last few weeks is the, the culture of NASA and all the agencies and contractors and, you know, places that fed NASA. Um, the astronauts got almost all the attention. Um, it's only now that we know names like you know, Gene Kranz. I mean, I, some people knew him in the 60s and 70s, but, but those are popular culture names now. Um, is that something any of you noticed when you first started working in the space programs, um, that there was a division or were the astronauts generally friendly and accessible? How, how, what was your experience with that like? I only do one astronaut, and that was Gus Grissom. Yeah. Um, and he was a real take charge kind of guy. Um, I was in a meeting once with him when the question was asked in kind of a light moment, uh, hey, Gus, what, uh, who's going to be first on the moon? And he says, me and some other guy. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think I defer to you for experts on the, the astronauts. Uh, I'm going to add a little twist to this because here meeting Gene and Harrison Jack Schmidt, mm -hmm. I never knew Gene, but I had worked with Jack and Neil and a lot of them in the training. Yeah. 
but uh, the memory is still there, but it's buried. It's buried in your brain to where you can start flushing out things and you discover new diamonds buried in that memory and they all come up and surface. It's been like the number of stories I could walk in here with are multiplied exponentially by these diamond fields that you're resurrecting. You realize how important those memories are. Yeah. But you don't get exposed to that until you start digging. I worked with a few astronauts uh, when I was working the Apollo, Apollo projects. Uh, the sister boiler plate of 1101 over here is 1102, and that was outfitted uh, completely on the inside with mocked up or simulated equipment. And we used that as a water egress trainer to train the astronauts and the the prime and the backup crews for each mission. So you're occasionally around those guys, and my impression of them, well, of them was always the sharpest guy in the room. And, uh, and then on Command Module 7, on our Block 2 test, we had a 48-hour test, and we had an astronaut crew, uh, Jim Lovell, Stu Rusa, and Charlie Duke. And uh, again, those really sharp guys, and you know they they listen intently to what you were saying, taking it all in, and then you know follow instructions to a T, because you know they were counting on us, giving them the right instructions. I never uh, worked with Charlie Duke, but he and Buzz, and Dave Scott, and Harrison Schmidt are the only four moonwalkers still living. And out of 33, actually, there were 12 landings uh, and 12 moonwalkers. Only four of them are still living. But out of uh, 33, actually, it was Gene Cernan. Uh, yeah, Gene Cernan and uh, uh, Jim Lovell that made two trips to the moon. And so that left you with 34 astronauts, if counting them as making two trips, and only 15 of those are still living, yeah. of all the ones. But I worked with Neil the most because I'd worked with him on the X-15. And uh, I was sitting right next to him after his ejection in our LLRV, which had been caused by a human error and lack of communication from ground control, which could easily have prevented the ejection. But he was didn't have a, bru a mark on him. And he started lisping and couldn't control his speech half hour after the ejection because he didn't realize it, but he had bitten his tongue. And it was swelling up on him. <laughs> but contrary to the uh, first man on the moon uh, dramatic right. film, they had him all marked up and bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and, you know, for a subject that's, that's getting revisited, that has been revisited over the years, there's still new stories. Like you said, there's still diamonds to find. Um, I'm thinking of films like Hidden Figures that show the, you know, African-American women who contributed vital, you know, calculations and math. Yeah. yeah. Um, are, are there other stories like that? Are there other tales that still have to be told? Or do you feel like we're starting to get the full picture of that time period of, you know, the 60s, the early 70s, when we did the most research and development and extra... Some months ago, I had read about the Apollo 8 crew being interviewed for a new documentary called First to the Moon. Mm -hmm. And that would have been Frank Borman, the commander, Bill Anders. What was it called? Return to the Moon. Return to the Moon. Gotcha. Or no, First to the Moon. First sorry. to the Moon. Okay. Return to the Moon is a Harrison Jack Schmidt book that I own. Yeah. And that's all about Helium 3 and, yeah. and getting back to mine the moon. But First to the Moon was uh, interviews by Bill, uh, 
uh, Bill Anders and and Frank Borman and uh, uh, Jim Lovell. Yeah. And um, I don't know if it ever came out as a documentary. I know they think they were raising money to finish the editing on it. Are there, are there stories you can think of that you just you don't know why they haven't been told yet? Not really. If you've watched <laughs> any of the, the documentaries on TV and the films and everything, you can easily get saturated, but I can watch every one of them over mm -hmm. and over. Well, you're discovering more, more diamonds when you do. Yeah. They'll yeah. pop you into your head. A little bit of information on from this one and that one. And uh, the latest one that's come out is, which I haven't seen yet, but it's uh, an Armstrong film. And, uh, and that's now on, on demand here in Denver. So I'll be watching that soon. What's the title of it? Armstrong Film. Okay. You mentioned hidden figures. Yeah. Uh, I, did, you, did you work with some of those women? Yes. Yeah. I, there was one assigned to our task, and she was a huge exp uh, help in making all those graphs. And mm -hmm. uh, she had a degree in math from uh, El Pat. Uh, you, you, um, Texas, uh, University of Texas at El Paso. Okay. And uh, oh, she she did her weight. She carried her weight really well. Yeah. Oh, she was light. She wasn't heavy. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> um, well, I think we are uh, we're coming up near the end of the panel here, so um, I want to thank everybody for coming and I want to give our uh, audience a chance to ask a couple questions if anyone's